is a new creation, right? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Since I've been born again. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus in John 3, 7? One of the most religious men of his day. You must be born again. Your religion, Nicodemus, isn't going to cut it. Born once, die twice. Right? Born twice, die once. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's what Jesus said. Believest thou this, John eleven twenty five 25, and 26. We are beginning a new series uh, this Sunday, right now. A series on nothing. The Bible has a lot to say about nothing. It employs the word nothing in relationship to a number of important things. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles this morning to the second chapter of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 2 through 4. Fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It's important to keep in mind the context here. The church at Philippi was a divided church. Two women, whom we read about in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, were quarreling. Euodius and Syntyche, sometimes termed odious and soon touchy. They were quarreling, and supposedly the members of the church were lining up behind one or the other of these two ladies. And the ministry of this church was being inhibited, was being impacted negatively. Now, just like the church at Philippi was a divided church, and the church at Corinth was also a divided church, which is why Paul had to say to them in 1 Corinthians 1.10, No, I plead with you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The church at Philippi was a divided church. The church at Corinth was a divided church, just like those churches were divided. Many churches today are divided as well. Well, what's the solution for that? The solution for division within evangelical churches today. Well, Paul's message here in verses 3 and 4 can be summarized in just one word, humility. Humility, that's the remedy, the resolve, the cure, the resolution for the atrocious division, the atrocious discord that we so often find within churches today. And I'd like you to notice here this morning what true humility involves. True humility involves, first of all, a proper attitude. It involves a proper attitude. You know, sometimes you'll hear it said about somebody, man, do they have an attitude. And by that it is meant, of course, that they have a bad attitude. Let me ask you this morning, do you have an attitude? A bad attitude. Unity in the church demands humility, and humility involves a proper attitude. An attitude, first of all, as Paul says here, that is not selfish. Look with me again at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. You know, you and I live in an extremely selfish society, do we not? I mean, your average Joe today is absolutely consumed with looking out for A number one. I mean, his thoughts are preoccupied with his needs, his wants, his desires. And sure, he'll scratch your back just so long as you scratch his, as long as there's something in it for him, as long as the deal is mutually 
beneficial. So what do I get out of this? What do I personally, and how much do I get out of this? That's the question that's on any, everybody's mind today. You know, I remember a few years ago, Rod and I were selling a vehicle, and the individual, this was a Christian guy, he came to our house, said he'd like to buy the vehicle, but he said, what I would like in addition is a tax receipt from your church for the price of the vehicle. Me, myself, and I. That's where people are at today. And of course, we live in a society that greatly encourages that type of thinking. I mean, I'm reminded of Whitney Houston's old song, Learning to Love Yourself is what? The greatest love of all. You know, in 1979, sociologist Robert Bella conducted extensive interviews with 200 average Americans. And he's, he studied their thoughts, their attitudes. He discovered a consistent pattern, which he coined ontological individualism. He said, when you get right down to it, people's basic orientation today is me. Their highest ideal, the only one they are prepared to champion, is self. And this impacts every area of their lives. From their business experience, they seek personal advancement. From their marriage experience, they seek personal development. And from their church, they seek personal fulfillment. It's all about them. Nobody else, just them. I'll tell you, with this sort of pervasive mindset, it's no wonder there are so many divorces today. I mean, I'll stay with you just so long as you contribute to my personal well-being, but the moment that stops, goodbye, see, I'm out of here. Sayonara. It's no wonder, indeed, that the divorce rate today is so astronomically high. You know, selfishness is so ingrained in our society that unless, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are very deliberate in rejecting the corrupt thinking of so many in our world, you yourself can fall prey to ontological individualism, to radical individualism. Humility involves a proper attitude, an attitude, first of all, that is not selfish, and an attitude, second of all, that is not conceited. Look again with me at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, which is so often the underlying cause for selfish ambition. Conceit, pride, ego, the desire for position, the desire for status, the desire to be seen, to be heard, to be admired. This is found within so many churches today. I mean, so many people today... Christian people identified with a local body are not unlike a Diotrephes, whom we read about in 3 John. Diotrephes who love to have the preeminence among them. You know, when you are objectively able to examine the downfall of certain churches, you see very often that this is the problem, bottom line. The problem, bottom line, can be attributed to pride. You know, I don't like my new pastor. Well, what's wrong with him? Does he not preach the gospel? No, he preaches the gospel. Well, is he an offensive sort of individual? No, he's not too offensive. Well, is he a drunk? No, he's not a drunk. Actually, the, the real issue, I, he's kind of long-winded. You know, before he came along, we used to get out sharply at noon. I mean, we were done right, right at noon. He closed with a benediction. Now, man, this guy keeps us probably 50% of the time to 12.03 or 12.04. Hey, what's the real issue here? Could it be that since this guy has come along, 
You're no longer the focus at your local church. I mean, is this guy raining on your parade? Is that what is eating you? Could it be that all of the negatives you say about him are really just a smoke screen and that the thing that truly bothers you is that you no longer are in the limelight? You know, sad to say, that's why a lot of Christians today choose to identify with a particular church. They get to be in the limelight. They get to be in control. It's nothing to do with the ministry. It has to do with them, ego. By the same token, some Christians choose to identify with a church because the church that they identify with doesn't really put anybody under conviction. They don't really hold anybody accountable. And that very often can be attributed to pride as well. You know, it's those kinds of individuals that produce a division within a church. Now, instead of a selfish, prideful attitude, Paul says at the end of verse 3, let each of you esteem others better than himself. Now, that's the kind of attitude that we as believers need to possess. One that regards others as better, not intellectually or morally, but one that regards others as more important than oneself. You know, after performing two piano concertos in Berlin, Johannes Brahms attended a dinner in his honor. And the host that night proposed a toast to quote the most famous composer. And Brahms immediately responded, quite right, here's to Mozart. On another occasion, Brahms was visiting a wine connoisseur who brought out several of his best wines, and as he poured one particular choice wine into Brahms' glass, he said, this is the Brahms of my cellar. Well, Brahms went through the tasting ritual. He looked at the, the glass of wine. He inhaled its bouquet. And after he did that, he said, better bring out your Beethoven. Now, this is the thing that Paul is describing here when he says that we need to esteem to regard others better than ourselves. It means we need to put others first. You know, I've got some great ideas. I've got some great ideas for uh, the new carpet in our church library. But you know what? For the sake of harmony, for the cause of Christ, for Jesus' sake, I'm going to be deferential to the insights and the wishes of others. I don't need to selfishly pursue my own agenda, to selfishly pursue what I want. Or, you know, I could be leading that new ministry. But John wants to lead, or Bob wants to lead, or Tim wants to lead. And you know what? I'm going to let him take the reins. He may not be as capable. He may not do quite as good of a job. But that really doesn't matter. I'm going to regard him as more important than myself. I'll tell you, how different do you think churches around our world would be if Christians really did have this kind of attitude? You know, Leonard Bernstein, the famous composer, was once asked what the most difficult, the, mo the hardest instrument is for anyone to play. And without the slightest hesitation, he responded, second fiddle. He said, I can always get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who plays second violin with as much enthusiasm or second French horn or second flute, now that's a problem. And yet if no one plays second, we have no harmony. Folks, the same is true when it comes to the local church. If no one plays second, there will be no harmony. And that's why it's important for us so important for us to have a proper attitude, an attitude that is not selfish and not prideful, but one that in lowliness of mind regards others as better than oneself. Now, true humility not only involves a proper attitude, true humility involves proper action, 
which of course inevitably results from a proper attitude. Look again with me now at verse 4. Let each of you look out, and not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now what do we see here? We see that as believers in Jesus Christ, we're to be on the lookout, and aggressively so, for the interests of our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, just as an aside, it's important to note carefully what Paul says here. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. See, Paul is not insisting here that we totally neglect ourselves, that we totally neglect our own interests. On the contrary, as God's people, we're, we're to have some concern for self, whether it be inside or outside of the church. We're to look after our bodies, we're to look after our families, and we're to involve ourselves in the ministry that God has given specifically to us. Paul's point, however, is that we're not to be concerned about self exclusively. In other words, instead of simply being wrapped up in me, I need to broaden my focus to include other members of the family of God. Let me ask you this morning, believer, is this something that you have done? Are you just as dedicated to the interests of others as you are to your own? Just as committed to pursuing the agenda of others as you are to pursuing the agenda of you. That's how Christian churches are to function, isn't it? I mean, we're to be seriously interested and seriously involved in the lives of other members of the family of God. This is what John was talking about. 1 John 3.16. One of the great 316s in the Bible. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. That's 1 John 3, 18. But in deed and in truth. Verse 16, by this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Then he goes on to say, verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, How does the love of God abide in him? You know, a number of years ago, Chuck Colson, in his book entitled The Body, recounts how in the second century, a pagan actor was converted to Christ. However, since most of the drama of that day encouraged immorality, and since young boys were often seduced into homosexuality in order to play the parts of women, this new believer soon realized he'd have to leave the theater. All he knew was acting, however, so he decided to support himself by teaching drama to new Christians. But before he began, he went to his church elders and explained his predicament and what he was planning on doing, and his elders immediately objected. They said this, look, if it is wrong to be in the theater, then it's wrong to teach others to be in the theater. The logic seemed clear, but since it was a unique situation and the young man had no other means of support, the elders decided to seek the wisdom of Cyprian, the early church father, the respected bishop of the church in Carthage. After some deliberation, Cyprian told the elders, you're correct, What is wrong to do is morally wrong to teach. But then he let them know that it was the duty of the church to take care of this young man. He said, look, if the young man cannot find other employment, you guys need to care for him. And if your church cannot care financially for this guy, He can move over to us in Carthage, and we'll look after him. Whatever his needs are, we'll take care of him. You know, when a church is operating with this kind of love, when the membership is rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, when they're bearing one another's burdens, when they're loving each other, 
not in word, but in deed and in truth, when they are assisting one another at every opportunity, when they're showing hospitality, when they're sacrificing financially, when they are looking out not just for their own interests, but for, their, for the interests of others, they will not have to worry about any sort of division. And they'll be an example to the outside world. Which very often mocks us for our disunity. For what they perceive to be phony spirituality. Now Paul had to say to the Philippian church, Philippians 1, 127, only that your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You're being watched so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What's important is the faith of the God. The outside world is looking at you in this disunity, this disharmony. is impeding the ministry. A unified church cannot be charged with phony spirituality. Individuals have to look and say, look how they love one another. Something going on there. Something unusual going on. In this dog-eat-dog world, man, that church sticks out like a sore thumb. When I was a kid in Sunday school, I learned how to spell joy. How would you spell it? Jesus, others, and you, right? Putting Jesus first, others second, and you last will result in joy, in individual joy, and it will also result in corporate harmony, harmony within the church. Harmony within the church demands humility. And humility involves a proper attitude and proper action. It involves doing nothing, doing nothing doing nothing through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than oneself. It involves each of us looking out not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. Help us, God. To this end, here at Bloomfield, For your glory. You may be here this morning and you're not a Christian. I'm going to talk about harmony within the church. You may not be a member of the church, Christ Church. You may not be saved. Kevin sang this morning, when I got born again, everything changed. That's what happens when a person gets born again. Everything changes for the better. So Bob Harrington, the chaplain of Bourbon Street, do you remember him? He came out years ago with an album. This is when albums were actually being produced and sold. It's fun being saved. It's great being saved to know that my sin, not in part but in whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Nothing better than that. To know that there's no condemnation to me, Romans 8, 1, because I'm in Christ. Nothing better than that. To know that nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. For I'm persuaded, Paul wrote in Romans 8, 38 and 39, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. Nothing better than that. Nothing better 
than to know that death for me is merely the gateway to glory. People today are frightened to death of death. Not me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because I'm saved. You saved? Now, we could talk about so many things this morning. You know, very often around the dinner table, Ron and I will we'll talk about politics. and We could talk about a lot of things. You think the Lions are going to make the playoffs this year? Supposedly, people are suggesting they're going to have a pretty good year. Inflation. Bottom line, the issues are eternal. Look, folks, none of us gets out of here alive. None of us. The point in on the man wants to die. And life is so short. And there's an after this. The point in on the man wants to die, Hebrews 9, 27. And after this, there's an after this. And after this lasts a good long time, like forever. 30 billion years from now, you're going to be someplace. 30 trillion years from now, you're going to be someplace. 30 billion, trillion, zillion years from now, you're going to be someplace. And it's a one of two places, and there's no in between. The way to wind up in heaven 30 billion years from now is to receive the way, the only way. Jesus said, I am the only way. I'm the only truth. I'm the only life. The only way to wind up in heaven forever is to trust Christ. I can't help you. If I could, I would. I can't help you. I can only point you to the Savior. Remember the Wizard of Oz? Go see the wizard. He'll help. Go see the Savior. He'll help. And you won't find a fake man behind a drape. When you go to him, he's the sovereign, omnipotent Savior. And if you trust in him, he'll take you to glory. How Wonderful. You know, I was reflecting this morning, I was writing this morning, and I was reflecting on the incredible nature of the gospel. Adam rebelled, that little lump of dust. You know, people talk today about suffering. Why does God allow suffering? Are you kidding me? That little lump of clay defied his creator. For no reason. He had everything. He had the world by the tail. Defied his creator. God had every right at that moment to create the entire human race in an instant and consign us all to hell. That would have been perfectly just, but instead, God sends Jesus Christ, who suffers an eternity of punishment on Calvary's cross for rebels without a cause. Blows me away. I don't understand it. I'm so grateful for it. I'm saved. And you can be saved because of the magnanimous grace of God. If you're not saved, this can be the greatest Father's Day you've ever had. If you're not saved, trust Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Father, 
May we make the personal application of this portion of Scripture, and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.